stop blaming me for murdering. Hey, nobody said anything about murdering. That's what it basically sounds like. I'm not a killer. There was a nice cream cone beside that that was just really don't know what I know, huh? Okay. Let's see how it is. I won't tell you anything else. These are some of the things 17-year-old Cody Metzger Madsen said during his interrogation. In August 2013, he was arrested on suspicion of unaliving his five-year-old brother, Dominic. Cody's relatives had a pretty consistent theory about what happened. But Cody, well, his conversation with the detectives would go many ways before the truth would finally be revealed. What had really happened that day? And what led Cody to commit such a heinous crime? This is the full story of Cody Metzger Madsen. On August 31st, 2013, Don and Julie Kuhlman got a chilling call from their daughter, Rebecca. Their foster son, five-year-old Dominic Elkins, ran off after being injured. Don and Julie lived on a huge patch of land in Logan, Iowa. They were specialized foster parents. Julie was even trained around children with special needs. They had twin daughters, 12-year-olds, Rachel and Rebecca, and three sons, Cody, Ben, and Dominic. Dominic had only been adopted a few weeks before the incident. However, by all accounts, he seemed happy with the family and there had been no strange incidents before. That day, the whole family had breakfast together and then swam in the pool, all but Ben, who was away for the weekend. Later, Don left to have dinner with his brother and Julie took Rachel to have ice cream with her friend, Dylan. We lived out in the country, but it was like five minutes or so to get to the little country store to get ice cream. Rebecca, Cody, and Ben stayed home as they were all tired from swimming. When Julie got a call that little Dominic was missing, she and Rachel immediately became frantic. Living in the countryside on a huge estate surrounded by woods, he could be anywhere by now. We left my sister, who was going to be like in charge just to keep an eye on the kids, and then it was Dominic and Cody. On the phone, Julie heard Rebecca and Cody panicking about the missing boy. They were both saying they just didn't know where he was and were urging Julie to come home ASAP. When Julie arrived, Rebecca told her that Cody and Dominic had gone to play together out in the backyard shortly after Julie had left. After a short while, Cody stomped back into the house crying. When Rebecca looked at him, he had a blood-stained mark on his forehead. She asked him what had happened and Cody said they were playing the Roman game inspired by the Percy Jackson movies when Dominic got upset. He said Cody was playing unfairly. So he grabbed a brick and hit Cody in the head, then hit himself before running away. Cody told Rebecca that he tried to follow Dominic, but he disappeared into the scenery and couldn't see him anymore. So he ran into the house to get help. As you're about to find out, this story was very far from the truth. Layers and layers of lies would be uncovered. And the first to uncover lies was Julie. So there was a bit of distance between my parents' house and my grandparents' house in the country. And there's this huge ravine that runs more than the length of the property enormous ravine. As soon as she heard Dominic was gone, Rachel thought that he had probably fallen down the ravine. So I said, mom, why don't you stop the car halfway between our houses and my friend and I can go like walk along the side of the ravine and see if we see Dominic. Meanwhile, Julie teamed up with Rebecca and Cody who were at the house and asked them to help her find Dominic. It was plain to see that Cody had blood on his face. It wasn't his blood, it was just splattered on his face. Dominic's blood sank because Cody wasn't hurt. But Cody was in a state of panic. He's saying, you know, we gotta find Dominic. I don't know where Dominic is. We gotta find him. He ran off. However, Julie knew her son. She knew Cody might know more than he let off. She knew his cognitive delays very well, his maturity, all that. You know, she just, she knew him and she kind of knew how to uh, work him if you will, you know, she told him, you know, you need to help us find him. Like, where is he? You know, let, like, let's go find him. And Cody said, okay, all right, okay, we're, you know, I think he went this way. Cody led the family straight into the steep ravine through thick weeds and fallen branches. After walking through what felt like a jungle for several minutes, Julie realized Cody was trying to fool them. The weeds were untouched. It was clear Dominic had not passed through there. And my mom says, Cody, we can help him. It's okay. Just take us where he is. 
we can help him, it's okay. You just have to get us there. I saw just a, a shift or a flip in Cody and he said, okay, all right, I'll take you to him. Cody then took his family out of the ravine and led them to the end of their property into another part of the ravine. Just around this time, Rachel called her dad and 911. Before the officers arrived, Rachel followed Cody to the bottom of the ravine under a tree and into a shallow river where Dominic was lying face down. And Cody is just standing next to him like, here he is. You, what, what do I do now? Rachel was only 12 at the time, but she took charge of that awful moment. And I'm screaming at Cody to get Dominic to pull him up out of the water because he was face first. Rachel was shocked to see how Cody lifted his little brother up. Cody just grabbed Dominic by his t-shirt and yanked him out of the water, almost throwing him on the bank. He had just picked him up and... He wasn't really gentle, which kind of irritated me. Dominic's body was swollen and blue. This was not a good sign. By now, Julie was at the top of the ravine, watching the whole scene and crying at the top of her lungs. She urged her twin daughters to perform CPR on Dominic, but they didn't know how to do it, and it was clear it was too late to resuscitate him. Within an hour, Dominic, his father, officers, and paramedics arrived at the scene. The property was filled with people trying to figure out what had happened, but the reality was just sinking in for the parents. Dominic was gone. As the officers were trying to catalog every potential clue around the property, Officer Jeff Kilpack went into the ravine where Cody was standing next to Dominic's body, together with his grandpa, Mick. Cody was crying hysterically. The only thing he said was, we were playing bricks. Mick then asked him, did you do this, Cody? To which Cody only cried harder. The scene was pretty clear to the officer witnessing this. Cody had definitely had a role in Dominic's death. That day, Julie was interviewed about Dominic's story. Remember, he had just been adopted by her and Dom. So why was he taken away from his biological mom? I don't, I don't know the exact answer. I don't know. But they don't tell you that? I. You know, they just say that parental rights were severed. He, you know, I was told that he could, you know, cuss like a truck driver, bite, kick, scream, attach you. And I thought, oh, great, you know. However, according to Julie, Dominic quickly learned the rules of his new household and behaved very well. In fact, Julie found him very intelligent for his age. It's smart. It is smart. Dominic did get into a fight at school that week and had to be restrained, but Julie was confident he was a good boy with lots and lots of love to give and receive. With proper care, he would grow up into a healthy, happy adult. Poor Julie seems composed in this interrogation, but she would take regular breaks to cry, and she would never recover from this tragedy. Two years later, she would pass away. Meanwhile, the entire family was interrogated, and the general topic was Cody's relationship with Dominic and Cody's behavior that day. What did you think about him screaming like he was? I was freaked out. Have you ever done that before? Start really screaming? Mm -mm. Well, sometimes when he gets aggressive, my mom will restrain him so he doesn't hurt anyone. Mm -hmm. And he'll like moan and growl at her and, you know, just... Did he do that at that time? Mm -hmm. He was crying and he wasn't being aggressive towards us. Clearly, Cody had some behavioral problems. Now the detectives had to interrogate him and see if they could get him to tell them exactly what had happened that day. First, they put him in a waiting room with an officer who was only tasked with watching him. Although the officer made no conversation, Cody started talking. It was pretty funny, but then one night I actually saw it. I was like, oh, and he just went past my face. I slipped out. I woke up and, and then he jumped when he saw it. Everyone was freaking out. They thought it was a goat. Then it was gone. There was a nice cream cone side bug though that was kind of weird. It looked exactly like an ice cream cone. Yet I do not understand. It takes aim. And it's, I had to do ground smash, punch. Good grief. That was all unprompted, but when the officer asked his colleague for a coffee refill, Cody revealed something important. Well, I know exactly why you drink coffee now. But lucky for me, I don't need coffee at night. Hmm. 
I stay up without the meds. If I don't take my meds, then I stay up. Cody had also been adopted by Julian Don about three and a half years before the incident. He was very cognitively delayed, um, exceptionally so. I remember my parents estimating that his um, mental age, if you will, was probably around six or seven. He had a volatile temperament, often going into fits of rage from apparently nothing. Rachel had even seen him on the family's poor chickens. You guys, hurting animals is a huge red flag. No one should do that. And if a kid does it, they should probably see a therapist. Sadly, even if Julie did work hard with Cody, he didn't show any signs of improvement. Now, the detectives had the tough job of making him open up. Cody was placed under arrest and changed into a jumpsuit that day. It's unclear whether he even understood the whole situation. As the detective was reading him his Miranda rights, he happily exclaimed that he knew them by heart. You have the right to mean silence. That means you do not have to say anything. Anything you say will be can and will be used against you in the court of law. I've read that actually on um, Batman before. Huh. Then Cody was asked what exactly had happened between him and Dominic that day. No, we were right beside the ravine. When you say we, you mean you and Dominic. Okay. See, we were playing Roman, like Greek mythology. Sure. Not to mention, here's a little clue for you. Here's a little Greek thing, but it's just a little starter, so that way I can calm down. What has four wings and has a really, and is red, and yet it is part one of Hades' minions? Starts with an F. Hmm, I don't know. What? Fury. Oh. The female detective, an agent from Iowa's Division of Criminal Investigation, sat in a confession pose throughout most of the interrogation. Through her body language and trusting tone of voice, she invited Cody to feel safe and tell the truth. I hate that thing. Yeah. Four wings, flapping separate wings. You lost me on that one. See, two wings go this way, two wings go that way. Okay. It was tough work for the detective to keep bringing Cody back to reality. Well. Romans have imperial gold savers in Greek mythology. Okay. And Greek has crystal bronze. So it's kind of bad. So what were you guys actually using? Well, he had a crystal, he had the gold imperial gold. I had the crystal bronze. We just used invisible. Oh, okay. Then he picked up a stick and tried to, but I was like, it's no sticks. Cody claimed that he didn't want to actually fight Dominic and that they were actually role-playing with invisible weapons. But then they got into a more physical fight and Dominic somehow ended up getting hurt by a rope swing above the ravine. That's when he hated me. Okay, what did he, how did that happen? He's basically saying, I'm going on the rope. So he just... Steps down. I tried to get him with the sword, but basically he says, "No." According to Cody, this is how Dominic hit his head. I saw blood. I was like, "It's Dominic." He was tumbling, literally tumbling, and he splashed in the water like this, face up. I saw blood going down the river. I was like, "It's hand." He gets up like this, and I saw a red streak going down on his head. Cody said he was too scared to climb down the ravine, but Dominic got up and started throwing rocks at Cody. This is how Cody explained the red marks on his face when the officers arrived at the scene. However, when he cleaned his face, it was revealed that he hadn't suffered any scratches, so the marks were from Dominic. After very obviously lying about a heated altercation with his five-year-old brother, Cody then claimed one of the most outrageous things yet. No, he grabbed the brick, I saw that, and he started running. But I was hurt. I just went and stood over so I could peek. He noticed I was gone, so he grabbed the brick and started smashing his face and started running while he's I didn't see him trip. Hmm. I didn't know. Why was he... I know he was almost to a deep spot, though. 
I didn't know that. Cody had thought of a story to tell the detective, but he didn't really think it through. Because of his cognitive delay, he probably didn't realize his story was not plausible. But how do you get a person like this to confess to taking a life? As the two detectives interrogated Cody, the other detectives gathered possible scenarios from the other family members. What do you think happened? Well, Cody's had a tendency in the past to lose his temper and be mean to people. And I know that he has a tendency to play, so I think Cody probably lost his temper. And I don't know Dominic well enough to I don't even care at this point who started it, I guess it doesn't matter. But. This was the scenario that came from all family members. Everyone believed Cody accidentally unalived Dominic in a fit of rage. But the truth was even darker, and Cody's detectives would slowly uncover it. You you and I both know that's not really what happened, is it? It is. Okay, stop being such negative. Well, Cody, we're, you know what we do for a living? We're officers. Okay? I we know what you all are. Time. What is that? Really, do I have to say it? I'm not no jail person. Okay? You're not a jail person? Okay. We well, I may be in jail clothing right now, but I'm not person that needs to be in jail. Once Cody was confronted with his actions, he got into an extremely defensive mood. He would not hear the detective's reasoning and he would accuse them of seeing him as guilty. We're not a criminal. Okay. Nobody accused you of being a criminal, okay? That's basically what you're saying. Listen to what he had to say after the male detective told him some of his accounts didn't make sense. He plays baseball. I understand. What do you think I meant? He has a strong arm for batting, strong arm for pitching. Why does it not make sense? Sheesh. Cody is talking about a five-year-old. His lack of empathy towards Dominic and the way he addresses the detectives is simply chilling. If he can hit as hard with a bat, then obviously he can hit hard with a brick. Right now, what you guys are trying to make me do? basically wrong, okay? Just gonna make me mad. Very patiently, the detectives explained that they weren't trying to make Cody do anything. Instead, they were trying to get justice for Dominic. When they asked him if his DNA would be found on Dominic or the brick, he said, obviously, I touched him. We were play buddies. But he was already in a volatile state. He's been very nicely. Yes. That's all I ever done. I don't kill. Stop blaming me for murdering. Hey, nobody said anything about murder. When the detectives pressed on for the truth, Cody suddenly started talking about someone else he had seen at the ravine. Who have you seen down the ravine? Well, I know I saw one guy, but I didn't know who he was. He had a cloak. A cloak? Like a cloak. Well, just like um, Harry Potter, except with a hood. He said that he saw this man pick up pipes and store them in his bag. He also said he found a loaded weapon and also put it in his bag. It's unclear whether Cody actually hallucinated this moment sometime before or if this was a story he concocted as the detectives pressed him for more information, hoping to put the blame on the mysterious hooded man. Yeah, but when the cops came, and they were grabbing me, I know his footprints. I looked at the corner of my eye and I saw a footprint, big one. Same exact size as the feet of the cloak's figure. But I think he hurt Dominic. That would be my guess. He probably tripped him because he doesn't come that easily. He's a fighter, I know that. So first he said he saw Dominic use the brick on his own face. Then he changed the story to a mysterious hooded assailant. For whoever he is, I hate him for killing Dominic, if he did. Also, did you hear him say he doesn't on that easily? Why would he know that? Cody went on to say that he only saw footprints, then that he saw the hooded figure from afar, then that he saw the man's eyes and they were different colors, all in just under five minutes. Cody's a bitch of a liar. Absolutely nothing comes out of his mouth is true. It takes a long time to get to the bottom, but when it finally does, then Usually you can see in his, his eyes and his face and his mannerisms and finally you kind of feel that he's, or realize he's finally telling the truth. 
I don't blame everybody for else, you know, trying to make up stories and none of them jive and none of them match. Once, he stole a box of fruit rolls and blamed all his siblings, one by one, before he admitted he did it. Stealing food as well as lying are common behaviors of neglected children who feel their needs won't be met by their carers. Cody was adopted at the age of 13 or 14. It's hard to gauge what sort of trauma he had endured with his biological parents or at the institutions where he spent his childhood before being adopted by the Coolmans. However, it is safe to say, adopting him at such a late age, Julie and Don didn't find it easy to repair his trauma and teach him that he is in a safe space where he doesn't need to steal or lie. The worst of problems is the longer it takes. Mm -hmm. This, I definitely ever tell the truth, at least not all of it, but he might. At around 2 a.m., Cody's interrogation was wrapped up. You mind if I say this word? Mm -hmm. It's, I'm not even gonna get enough sleep, am I? How many times have you seen a child be murdered? More than once. Okay, so then it could be anything. It could be anyone that is a child murderer. Where is the logic in that statement? Also, watch how Cody always raises his palms up when he is trying to cover for himself. He is not confident when trying to manipulate the detectives. However, he does it again and again in desperate attempts to avoid confessing. Then, Cody went on another rant about the hooded man, saying he remembered his eyes were green and brown, and ensuring the detectives he would let them know if he saw him again, as if Cody was going home that night. I have a feeling that I won't be running into him, so... I, I have a feeling that I might. Might. She kind of show up when bad things happen? Mm-hmm. He shows up every time. Every time. Right outside the house, in the woods, hidden. By asking that question, the detective delves into Cody's potential psychosis. You see, some suspects try to act as if they have psychosis in order to get an insanity defense and a lesser punishment. Such suspects say things like, I see or hear things that aren't there, but they know the things aren't there, it is all an act. People who actually suffer from psychosis normally say they see or hear more than other people. They think those around them are simply less observant. This was the case with Cody. He told the detectives he saw details that his family didn't and insisted he was very good at seeing the hooded figure when others weren't as good. Didn't, except that I could see him. Mm -hmm. Pathetic hider, if you ask me. I have an eye for detail. By now, the detective knew this might explain at least a part of Cody's behavior. However, psychosis does not explain violent behavior or unaliving your younger brother. This was not a motive. Down there with Dominic, was it an accident or was it on purpose? It, I know it was an accident. That's the only, that's the only thing I can figure out. Cody played the detective's game but did not realize this was an admission of guilt. Still, he went back to the rope swing breaking theory. But I know there are a lot of termites over at the house and even term, um, house, like wood ant, ever heard of those? Mm -hmm. So it's probably been chewed up by that. Do you, do you find yourself thinking about death and stuff a lot? Yeah. What? I think that I might, I, I just keep on thinking that I might die. Mm -hmm in a different faith that is so difficult to complicate. As soon as he said that, the detective left the room and left Cody alone. That's when he noticed the recorder and started speaking to himself. Yeah, huh? Okay. Let's see how much you like it. Hmm? You really don't know what I know, huh? Okay. Let's see how it is. When the detective came back, Cody told him off for recording their interrogation, even though, as you already know, this is standard procedure and has been for decades. I didn't expect you to do that. Mm -hmm. I found out that re that was a recorder. I thought it was something else. Well, guess what? What? I'm not telling you anything else. I don't like recorder people. Mm -hmm. I'm not much of a media person. Thank you very much. 
Cody was thus placed in custody for the night. He was charged with first degree murder, but the question remained, why had he decided to do this to poor Dominic? During the investigation before Cody's trial, a dark fact was revealed. Cody had witnessed and possibly endured physical at his original home. He would huddle on the floor into a fetal position whenever men raised their voices at him. He would sometimes stay in a crouched position for 20 minutes before standing up, even when there was no more danger. This indicates deep trauma. Perhaps there were even worse things he'd endured that his caseworkers didn't know about. He was also diagnosed with ADHD and his biological mother consumed meth while pregnant with him. His own mother stated at his trial she'd consumed $20 worth every single day for the first three months of her pregnancy. Did she not know she was pregnant? Did she not care? This action can lead to a baby born with cognitive impairments, problems with attention and memory, and difficulties with motor skills. Cody suffered from at least the first two. ADHD, impulsivity, and aggression are also linked to consumption during pregnancy. Cody showed all of these. You know, if it didn't happen that night, he very easily could have attacked Dominic another night, or he could have attacked me or my sister, you know, or he could have never done it. On November 5th, 2014, over a year later, Cody testified in court that he did unalive his little brother. He left the hooded figure to the side and explained that what he'd claimed Dominic had done to himself with the brick, Cody, in fact, did to him. Then he drowned him in the river. However, Cody did not take responsibility for the attack. He claimed he thought he was doing something else that day. Cody thought he was slaying the goblin commander of the goblin army with a shining sword. Cody Metzger Madsen says yes, he five-year-old Dominic Elkins with a brick, but he says he was lost in a fantasy when it happened. It looked like there were goblins per se, a lot of them green, ugly little creatures. Apparently, Cody had first told this to his psychiatrist months after the doctor had started working with him. Cody came to trust his psychiatrist more than his adoptive parents or other adults in his life. So he began confessing to what had happened that fateful day. Reportedly, Cody felt attacked by goblins that day and hit back with a brick. I remember attacking him with an it in his face. At this, at that very moment, do you, did you realize it really was Dominic? No, I did not. During his testimony, the prosecutor confronted Cody with his previous stories, the rope swing breaking, Dominic hurting himself, the hooded figure, and Cody got defensive again. Well, first off, the way you're saying it is kind of hurting my feelings in a way, because I'm figuring that you don't really believe me, do you? Did he have any remorse though? Do I feel bad? I feel like a regretful little punk. Why is that? Well, first off, I never even wanted to hurt Dominic. I would have never hurt Dominic. He was like a brother that I haven't had for a long time. At least that sounded genuine. Finally, there was a verdict. The judge explained that as per Cody's psychiatrist report, Cody suffered from psychosis. And at the time of his interrogation, Cody was still in a psychotic state that caused him to take Dominic's life. In his experience, people who suffer from acute psychosis, delusions, or hallucinations do not instantly or quickly move from that psychotic state to a non-psychotic state. Dr. Dennert pointed to Metzger Madsen's lies to the Coleman's and to investigators as compelling evidence that defendant knew on August 31st that what he had done to Dominic was wrong. The bottom line, Cody knew right from wrong after unaliving Dominic. However, he was in an acute psychotic state when he did so. And in that state, he didn't know right from wrong. It is the verdict of the court that defendant Cody Metzger Madsen is not guilty of murder in the first degree by reason of insanity. Cody was sentenced to an indefinite time at a facility for the criminally insane. He will be there until doctors consider he is well enough to be released and reintegrated into society. Cody continued to doodle as he listened to his verdict. Dominic's biological mom, Barbara, was there, listening to all the horrific details of her son's death. 
she left the courtroom in tears when she heard the verdict. It's hard to say if Cody will ever realize the full extent of what he had done and how this is affecting a lot of people to this day. This is what makes this case so heartbreaking. There is just little justice for Dominic. He only got to spend a few weeks with his new family, and the person he was closest to, the boy he saw as his big brother, betrayed him in the worst way imaginable. Hey, thanks for watching. What do you think about this case? Was Cody's goblin story true, or was it another attempt to receive a lighter sentence? Let me know in a comment, and before you leave, make sure you like and subscribe. See you next time!